Hey guys, how's everybody doing? I'm so excited you're joining with us here on YouTube. Uh, if you're new to JSM or Journey, uh, my name is Justin. I'm the student pastor at Journey Church, and I just want to welcome you and say that I'm glad you're joining us. I hope you enjoy what you see. And uh, we're just going to be continuing in a series that we've been in for the past several weeks called Doubt It, where we're just talking about um, the questions and the doubts that may come up, whether they're about God or about our faith and, and what to do when we're faced in those times. But first, I want to start out by talking to you about road signs. So we all know what this sign is. It's a stop sign. Or maybe, or maybe this sign that tells us not to enter a street. Um, but then there are some other signs that can be rather confusing, like this sign that just says circle on it. But if you saw this next sign, which is a roundabout sign, it would make sense. That circle sign just means a roundabout, but it's not super clear if you've never seen it before. And then there's this other sign that I can't begin to tell you what it means. I, I just can't figure it out. I don't understand it. And just like some of these signs are easy to understand, some of them weren't. And in the same way, life can be that way. Sometimes it can be super clear about what we're supposed to do next, what decisions we're supposed to make. But then other times we might be unsure of exactly what God is, is leading us to do. We're not sure what decision God wants us to make next. And a lot of times our doubts and our questions, they feel us leaving confused. They feel us wishing that we had a sign to, to point us in the right direction. And that's why we're in this series called Doubt It. And we've been talking about, like I said in the beginning, what to do when we have doubts and when we have questions about God. And so this week, we're going to be wrapping this series up, specifically talking about what to do when we're questioning what God wants us to do. So what are we supposed to do when we're questioning what God wants us to do? And the reality is that we can't know the future. I mean, we can, we can dream about things. We can have hopes. You guys in high school... Even in middle school, I'm sure you have hopes and dreams of what you're going to do. But the reality is, we don't know exactly what job you're going to have. You don't know exactly who you're going to marry. You don't even know exactly how many kids you're going to have. You don't know where you're going to live, where life is going to take you. Like I said, you might have hopes and goals, but there's no way, unless you're a fortune teller, there's no way of knowing for sure what the future holds. And so the reality is that the, the direction of life is largely unknown, and that can be scary at times. Just like now, we're, we're living in a scary time now where it's unknown. We don't know when the government's going to tell us that we can leave our homes again. I mean, we can leave them now, but they're telling us it's not smart. We don't know when the next time um, we're going to be able to, to just go out in public normal. We don't know when we're going to get the okay to shake hands and hug people again. This virus, this coronavirus, this pandemic that we're living in right now, it's a big unknown and it can make life scary. And, and just like that, uh, Dee and I had a, a fairly scary time early on in our marriage. Um, a, lot of you, a lot of you know that I moved down here to the Charleston area to uh, help start a church plant. And um, I was serving as the student pastor there, and with it being a church plant, I was I was a volunteer, um, didn't get receive an income from the church, and so what I did to make a living was I repaired appliances full time, and this was it was great work, it was great pay, but it was hard work. I mean, I was driving around in a van, going into people's houses, fixing their appliances, and a lot of times I was working from 7 a.m. in the morning to 7 p.m. at night, and what this did is it left very little time for for my ministry preparation. Um, I had to do everything after work. So um, I would go to work from seven to seven. I would come home, go into my office, shut the door, do some uh, work on my youth lesson, do any sort of church work that I needed to be done. And what that did is it left very little time for me to spend with D. Um, and it was tough. That was our first year of marriage and it made our first year of marriage pretty tough. And um, so we finally realized that we had to decide whether I was going to keep this good paying full-time job um, 
or if I was going to quit it for the sake of my marriage and my ministry. On the one hand, um, it would leave us with one salary due as a teacher, which which wasn't enough for um, for our expenses, and it wasn't an easy decision. Uh, to be honest with you, I just wanted God to tell me what to do, and He didn't do that, and He kind of left me and D uh, to our own devices to kind of figure that out. And and while that was a tough decision, it's nothing compared to one that the prophet Elijah had to make. So you may be familiar with the prophet Elijah to give you a little background on him, uh, where we're going to pick up his story. He has just challenged these prophets of Baal. There were 450 of them, and basically they threw down. Um, he's He said, you know, let's Let's do this. Let's do this ritual. Let's see whose God is the true God. And ultimately, Elijah won. God proved that he was the one true God. And and following that that contest, Elijah had all 450 men killed. Well, these men, um, the, the the queen at the time, Queen Jezebel, she found out about Elijah having all of these prophets killed. These were her prophets of Baal, and, and, and he had them killed. And she reached out to him and she said, look, I'm going to kill you. you. You've you killed my prophets, and so now I'm going to kill you. And, and, and despite what Elijah had just seen, he had just seen God rain down fire from heaven. Despite that, he panicked and he ran. He, he ran for his life, found a tree, and just sat there, sat under this tree and and. And he even at at one point asked God to take his life. Asked God to take his life. And and instead, God provided an angel of the Lord uh, who brought him food and brought him drink for two days. Two days in a row he did this. And then finally, God told him to move on. It was time for him to move on. And so Elijah did that. He moved on to the place that God was telling him to go. And uh, when he got there, he found this cave to hide in. And and then we see... um, God steps in and has a conversation with Elijah, and this is what their interaction was. Starting in uh, 1 Kings 19, verse 9, it says, There he came to a cave and lodged in it. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, and he said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? He said, I have been very jealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the people of Israel have forsaken your covenant thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. And I, even I only, am left, and they seek my life to take it away. And he said, Go out and stand on the mount before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by, and a great and strong wind tore the mountains and broke in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, the sound of a low whisper. And when Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his cloak and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. And behold, there came a voice to him and said, What are you doing here, Elijah? He said, I have been very jealous for the Lord, the God of hosts. For the people of Israel have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. And I, even I only, am left and they seek my life to take it away. And the Lord said to him, Go, return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus, and when you arrive, you shall anoint Hazael to be king over Syria, and Jehu, the son of Nimshi, you shall anoint to be king over Israel, and Elisha, the son of Shaphat, of abel Meholah, you shall anoint to be prophet in your place. And the one who escapes from the sword of Hazael shall Jehu put to death, And the one who escapes from the sword of Jehu shall Elisha put to death. Yet I will leave seven thousand in Israel, all the knees that have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. So God's instructions here, after after he comes and shows himself to Elijah, they may not make a lot of sense to us, and they may be pretty boring at first. You know, he just tells Elijah to go find these guys, do this, do this, do this. But what God is telling Elijah to do here is he's telling Elijah to connect with people. He's telling Elijah to connect with a group of people who could help him. Because you see, even though Elijah had been in the presence of God and he had even been comforted by God directly, still, 
God knew Elijah needed other godly people to help him carry on. God knew that Elijah needed other godly people to help him carry on. And it's, it's very easy for us to question what we're supposed to do when we're faced with uncertainty. Questions like, what do we do next? Questions like, why isn't God making this path clear for, it, for me? Well, Scripture never promises that God is going to tell us what to do next. That's the reality. Scripture never tells us that, that God's going to make life easier. He knows it, he ne- it never tells us that He's going to tell us every single step of the way of what we're supposed to do. But Elijah's story, it shows us that we need godly people to figure out things sometimes. We need godly people around us to help us figure things out. How do we make decisions when God isn't clear? The way that we do that is we get a support system. Because God, because godly people can help us with our questions. When we surround ourselves with godly people, they can help us. They can feed into us and help us with the questions that we have. And so going back to my story, I had a tough decision to make. I had to decide whether I was going to keep my good paying job and risk failing at my marriage and failing at ministry, or I could quit my job and succeed in those areas, but I'd have no idea where those finances to support myself and my wife were going to come from. There was no way I was going to know that. So I had that tough decision, but the reality was I had godly people in my life to help me make those decisions. And one of those godly people was was my wife, D. Um because we had been talking, we had been praying about it, and, and I was still not sure what we were supposed to do. It was a tough decision, and um, this happened during a, a big ice storm that we had here in Charleston, and and school was canceled, and so Dee was stuck at home. I still had to go to work, and so she spent a lot of time just in the Word, um, praying, and, and she called me that day while I was at work, and she just said, I think God's telling me that, that we, need to, we need to quit your job. And as scary as that was... Ultimately, that's the decision that I made. Fast forward a month later, and uh, my boss was trying to talk me into staying, and and I just said, look, if you can get me off work by 5 o'clock every day, if I'm not getting home at 7, 8 o'clock some nights, if I can be off work and home by 5 o'clock every single day, I'll stay. And he said, that's all you needed? Well, Well, we can do that. And so that's what we did. I stayed on that job until I came and worked here at Journey, and uh, I was able to keep my job. I was able to um, love my wife well, and and, uh, we were able to support our ministry well. And all of that, none of that may have been possible without having that support system of D, someone who who follows God and and listens for God. Um, I may have made the wrong decision had I not been listening to her, had I not reached out to her for advice. And it was a scary decision. I wasn't sure what God wanted me to do. But through that support system, through being surrounded by people who love God, I was able to make the right decision. So I want you to think about your own life. I want, to think about, I want you to think about your own support system. Everybody's support system looks a little different, but, but it's always good to have someone like a cheerleader. Is there someone in your life who encourages you and, all, and is always ready to give you a pep talk? Do you have somebody in your life who you know will always give you good, godly advice? Not just good advice, but good, godly advice. Because we can get good advice. It may not be godly, but it can still be good. But what we need to ensure that we have in our life is someone who is going to give us good, godly advice. What about a mentor? Maybe someone in your life who's older than you, they're wiser than you, and, and somebody who can help you to become a better person. They've been through life, they've made decisions, they've made bad decisions, they've made good decisions, but they've done life. You need to have a mentor in your life who can help you to grow. And then finally, what about someone who is helping you to grow deeper in your relationship with God? If you're familiar with Journey at all, uh, you hear us talk about DNA partners all the time. This would be that person, someone who can help you to, to grow closer and to grow deeper in your relationship with God. And the reality is that a support system, it doesn't guarantee that we'll always make the right decisions, but a support system does make making good decisions better, easier. Having a support system, it helps us to make those good decisions. 
We may not make the right decision all the time, but that support system, it will help us to make good decisions. So as we close out this series, I just want to recap what we've been talking about. You know, the first week we talked about how your questions, your doubts are normal. And the reality is that you are not alone in your questions. And then we talked about how God doesn't shame us for our questions. And instead, he gives us the evidence that we need in order to believe. God doesn't shame us for our questions. And then last week, we talked about how it's tough when life gets painful. It's tough when things don't make sense. And the reality is that our questions, they don't always get answered. But God is with us in the midst of it. No matter how difficult, no matter how tough our questions are, no matter if they get answered or not, God is there with you. He is in the midst of whatever you're going through. And then finally, when we're questioning and doubting where God is leading us, He knows, God Himself knows that godly people can help us with our questions. And He gives a support system to help us. So if you've been with us all four weeks of this series, I want to give you two takeaways that I hope you'll 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 remember from this series. If you don't take if you don't take anything away from this entire series, the past four weeks of teaching, I want you to take away these two things. The first one is you don't have to be afraid of your questions and your doubts. Like I said, they're normal. I have them. Your leaders have them. We all have questions. We all have doubts at times. And you don't have to be afraid of that. And the second thing that I hope you'll take from this entire series is that you can safely voice your questions and your doubts here. You can safely voice your questions and your doubts here at JSM. We want to help you through whatever it is you're facing. We want to help you through your struggles. We want to help you through your doubts. And so my hope is that you would feel comfortable sharing those doubts in your small groups, that you would feel comfortable coming to myself or D to share those struggles. And, and that's why um, next week we're actually not going to start a new series, but we just want to continue in this not in this series, but just with this same thought in mind. And, and we want to address some of your questions. So, so after, after this um, message, uh, I hope that you'll go on to our Instagram. Uh, we've, got a, we've got a post up on our story where we just want you to send us your questions. We want you to send us your doubts about God, about faith, whatever questions or doubts you have, send those to us. And we just want to talk about those with you guys. Uh, we may talk about it through uh, YouTube like we are right now. Um, we may talk about some of those questions and doubts just through social media, whether it be on Facebook or, or Instagram. Um, don't be afraid that we're going to out you on any of your doubts or questions. We'll answer all of them anonymously. Um, but we want to help you guys, and this is one of the ways that we hope to do that. So so I hope that you guys will join us in that and um, that we'll be able to help you through some of those questions and doubts that you have about life. So you'll be able to find that over on our Instagram. Our Instagram handle is at journeystewmansc, which you should see on the screen. And um, we just want you to join us in that. Throw throw your questions, throw your, throw your doubts at us. We want to help you walk through these questions and doubts that you have about life. And another thing that I, that I hope you'll join us in is, is immediately after this message at 7.30, 7.30, um, we are going to have a Zoom hangout, um, which is a, it's an online uh, video chat service. And um, we just want to see you guys. It's hard not to meet face to face. And so we're going to have some of your leaders, some of your other um, students in JSM are going to be over on the, on that service. And so uh, if you want the link to that chat room, um, reach out to some of your friends at JSM or maybe reach out to uh, your small group leader. They've got those links. They can get you into the chat. We just want to have some fun together. It's not going to be anything serious. We're just going to hang out. We're going to talk about what's been going on in our lives. And um, we just miss you guys. And we want to see you. So I'm going to pray and then uh, we'll be done. God, I just thank you for just this opportunity that we have to, God, in spite of not being able to meet physically, God, we can still worship. We can still gather in your name. And so, God, I pray that you would speak through this message, God, that that someone who heard this message would just, um, God, it would just touch their hearts. God, there are so many of us who are struggling with doubts and questions. And God, I just pray that you would help us to realize that you have provided us with people around us 
who can help us through those doubts and questions. God, you've put people strategically in our lives, godly people who can help us with our questions. They can help us with our doubts. Because God, you knew that we needed that. You knew that we needed a support system to help us through times. So God, I just pray for those who may not have that support system. God, I pray that you would help them to discover who those people are in their lives, God. And I, um, God, I just pray that for some of us, maybe you would help us to realize that we are that support system for someone else and that we would be a helping hand to them. So God, we just thank you and we love you for everything that you do. It's in your name we pray. Amen.